and go to GitHub. And then you can do opening cola here. Okay, let, let's wait. <coughs>
data we are using is directly from the client process. So no need to download. Oops. Very 
smart portal, which will give you uh, directly access to the, the core of the, the Python. Okay. Oh, yeah. So you almost kind of see the L. There. Uh, you also have kind of canvas, okay? <laughs> Since uh, we have experience in workshops where you have to set up things um, at once in the garage, everything is not working, and you spend a lot of time setting your computer to work. You prefer everything on color for you to run just using your link. If you prefer, you also have the same version of what we are presenting to you on color canvas. On the address on GitHub that Peter provided to you, if you look at the right me, you can find all the links. So, here is the repository, the right me, and you have a clear button opening color that immediately starts everything for you. But if you prefer, you can find information about the workshop, the prerequisites, which I fairly sure everyone here is more than ready for that. And all the instructions for obtaining the tutorial here. We have prepared a main course presentation, <coughs> and you can assess it using Google Colab by this link, or you can use Cadre Canvas with the link just below. In the end, if we have time, we can also make an exercise together in order to see how easy it is to use all the ideas and technicalities that we provided to you. Uh, another thing that I want to mention before passing again the word to Pietro is that if you have any questions, not related, of course, on um, the running of the material, um, Curiosities or questions about the technicalities we propose to you, we just leave them at the end of the presentation. Thank you. Okay. <coughs> so, uh, a quick overview for those that uh, just arrived. Uh, we have downloaded with um, the Boston data set. Okay, we have transformed the target value into a categorical one, assigning zero to the lowest value, 90% the lowest value, and one to the top 10%. In this way, we are working now with a categorical, with a um, classification problem, okay? As I mentioned, the, the training set is very small, but in this way, given that we have the time to constrain, we can go a little bit faster. Okay, so, um, if you want to know a brief introduction about these models, uh, you can find this introduction in the, in, in the book that I, I've been reviewing, in fact, which is called Python Data Science Essentials. I think these, these are three descriptions of the, of the main uh, libraries, for, of the, the three dedicated libraries and the general one that maybe Luca can, can explain you better since he's the author and, uh, and will show you very easily because in the end they are the same, they do the, they do the same, but they are slightly different and they are slightly different also in the performance. Since they are slightly different, this is important for planning, for example. Okay? If they were the same, you cannot do that. Okay. Nowadays, uh Technically, a kind of competition is not a new job. You have many choices, especially when you have to deal with tabular data, and maybe tomorrow you will have, because I don't know if it will be a deep learning problem that you have to tackle in the competition of tomorrow, the offline one, maybe it's tabular data. Um, gradient boosting is a good solution, but you will have opportunity to use HGBoost, LightGBM, and Boost. Each one of these has different strong and weak points. They are all gradient boosting, so we are talking about an algorithm which is semi in its essence, it's just a reiterative fitting on the residuals of previous three estimators. But for example, if you are using HGBoost, you have a technicality that uh, privileges, for example, splitting exhaustively on the same variables. If you are using LightGBM instead, it has a different strategy it tries to go as deep as possible in the branching, concentrating on each feature of time. And finally, cut boost. Cut boost is very strong in providing you support in categorical and high cardinality variables. In this case, otherwise, you have to do the encoding, the transformation of these categorical variables by hand, by your own code, into numeric values. Cut boost can do so in our workshop, we showed you
how we optimize each of these three because we don't know in advance which one will perform the best for your problem and maybe they can all provide to you a piece of the final winning solution for you tomorrow. So let us pass again to Pietro. Yeah. Basically, what is the, the key point? He, um, he will show you how to optimize algorithms, but how do you notice that it is optimized? First, we start with a very simple configuration of three of them. Okay, so that you start with GBM by GBM, that is you So a standard configuration, something that is very um, straightforward. Uh, for example, the learning rate is uh, 006 because empirically we know that it's uh, supposed to be less than 01. The depth is six. Nothing special. I mean, nothing. Nothing really. Um, I didn't. I spent zero seconds on this. I simply took a standard configuration. And let's see. What do we get? Okay, splitting the, the train and the set setting and sort of a, um, cross validation uh, of the three models. Okay, we will evaluate each model with this function, with the, which is the average precision score. Uh, we choose this instead of uh, the rock core because we wanted to um, really understand how good they, we were at getting the real values. Okay? We didn't, while the rock core would give um, an indication of the, of the ranking. Okay? We don't want this, we want to know if we are good or not at, at um, get, yeah, at, um, detecting this, um, rare, this um, small category. You see the categories are uh, very unbalanced, 90% zeros and 10% one. Okay? So we start with these, okay, and we have an error now. <laughs> this is how it happens. <laughs> no, it happens, yeah. okay. First of all, yeah, we, we define the rounds. We give a maximum number of rounds, and then he will decide which is the best round, okay? This is also a, a key strategy, because I will, since optimization problems are very complex, and would take some time if I can provide my friend Luca for a, already a given a, a, a range of um, of iteration. He will um, he will uh, earn sometimes to get more complex uh, optimization. So we see there we have the, the best iteration for the three models and the um, accuracy. Okay, it looks like Glide GBM is uh, smashes all the others. I mean, it's a really impressive how different they are, but this is probably due to the fact that the data set is, is very small, okay? But let's pretend that we are in a, in a working environment. In this case, uh, we, uh, we know that the light GBM is very good, okay? But still we did not make any feature engineering. But let's start thinking about what we are going to see next. At this stage, uh, if for example in Kaggle, we would uh, wonder if it's better to make blending or not. In this case, I would advise that to forget about blending and go for light GBM and try to spend more on this because the difference is huge, okay? So blending would end up at this stage maybe not giving that much value, okay? If they were very close to the score, then it makes more sense, okay? So this is the best iteration. So like GBM, it, it's crazy how it's, with less iterations, it gets the best score, okay? So let's try some uh, polynomial feature that they are, uh, you can get easily with this, um, this command, we transform it, this is this, and then we predefine it a little bit in order to have some variables, okay? And we add these features to the original trade, okay? So we have these features, these are the polynomials that did, these were the, the first one. Why am, what is that I'm doing now? I'm trying to see if adding features is helpful or not. And then discuss how much is helpful and if it's worth or not. This is a very important question when you are in a work environment, okay? Because time matters, okay? And computation also. So, we see now with this new feature, what do we get? Okay? It will be, of course, a little slower, okay? But in the end, we will get the result. This is why, again, we choose a very small data set, okay? Because we go fast here, step by step, in an interactive way, and we pretend to be in, in, a, in a work environment, in a heaven environment. Let's see now the statistics that we have. Okay, so light GPM increased the, 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 num the best number of rounds, which makes sense because we have, you have more, more variables, so he, wants, he, has, he needs more to understand, to learn from the data. Okay, it's boosting 
remain the same and also as we learn increase a little bit. Let's see the scores. The scores, uh, in the case of la GBM, we have an increase of, let's say, 1.01, point, one. okay? Very small increase. As scalar, it actually decreased. And uh, we can say that it's boost, it's pretty much the same. Okay, so now if we come to the first, let's say, uh, exercise of the, of the workshop. So we try to understand, to answer these questions. First of all, what do you think? Should we use all methods and mix them up in a competition? If we were doing a capital competition, what do you think? Would it be useful, given these values, to mix the model? Or, as I said before, we still? No, we use the gap as to so I, I, would, I would still focus on live GPM. Normally, uh, the uh, work environment and competition environment are very different. In that case, for example, if I ask you, should we mix all methods in a work environment, in a work project, again, the answer would be no. Normally, the, what happens in my experience is that, is that in the work environment, it's very dif difficult to find um, it useful to mix a lot of models, while in competitions, it's always useful. The difference thing here is that even competition would be useful, unuseful, given the numbers, okay? Given the numbers. These numbers are based by the, the fact that the set is small, okay? Again, another question. What about the polynomial features that we added? Are they useful or not? Yes. In a competition. We see that we go move through 0.88 to 0.899, so almost 0.9. In a competition, yeah. In a competition, yes, because this is a very small increase, but how many positions do you get in the idol? Who, who, each one of us has some experience. How many, how many positions do you expect? Maybe 200 or 300. Maybe you win the competition with this, okay? But what about the work environment? What your boss would say if you go to the boss and tell him, okay, I'm adding, uh, let's say, uh, more than 1,000 features and I will gain 1.01 .01 of accuracy, but I will give you an answer in 10 days. What do you think he would say? He would say no. <laughs> so, and this is the, 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 the this, this, let's say, little introduction to the different methodology. And what I try to, to put in is my daily life experience, which is basically like this, dealing with trade-offs, always trade-offs, accuracy versus uh, time, uh, accuracy versus complexity. And, um, and it, it's, on my side, it was important to make clear that a competition is one thing and uh, the work is, is another thing. They say so also about barments, you know? <laughs> they are, they, they are, I'm, I, I'm once assisted to a debate in which there were, there were cocktail men that were very good at competition, but then when they are uh, in a bar, they end up messing everything because they are not prepared to the people that come to you. Hey, you have, you have to give me this, I don't care about it, give me this, give me that, and so on. So now we have the models. We have the interactions, and we've seen that like, like GBM works better, but the job is not ended because we need Lucas help to see which are the best parameters. You remember, I made very strict formal parameter setting. I did, didn't even think about it. I simply copy faster. What I normally do on Kylo. So, Luca, I can switch on the logic. Switch spikes. <laughs> But at a certain expense. 
lapse of time. So I will also provide to you some intuition when it's good and when it's not good to use Bayesian optimization. So let's start, first of all, having the package of choice installed to the latest version. We decide to use Psychic Optimize. Uh, basically, if you already have some experience with Bayesian optimization, there are two main packages in Python that you can use. One is called Hyperopt, and the other one is Psychic Optimize. What's the difference? Well, Hyperopt is a little bit older, and it is focused on just one optimizer called uh, um, Pardon of Three Estimates. What is that? Actually, if you look inside the algorithm that Hyperopt uses for optimization, you will find out that it optimizes each hyperparameter alone. So you can imagine it finds the best parameter A, and then ignoring what's the best parameter for A, it will look for the best parameter for B. So there is no interaction between what <coughs> you are optimizing. Clearly, if in the long run, if you test by hyperopt many possible configuration, it will figure out that, for example, A and B are correlated, so it will provide you the right estimates. But uh, if you think there are many negative boosting parameters that actually are strictly connected to each other. And so we decided to use Psychic Optimize because it has a series of optimizers that consider all your parameters together. So they are considered in their interaction. For example, the number of iterations that you take and the learning rate are considered at the same time. And this is optimal because they can converge, in this case, uh, the Bayesian optimization can converge earlier and provide earlier to you the answer. Uh, we also install uh, the latest version of CatBoost. Actually, CatBoost is the only one that gave us a little bit more problem in being used with the Psychic uh, Optimize. I think because both Psychic Optimize and CatBoost are very intensively developed, being developed uh, packages. So being now under uh, often revision and new feature addition, they need actually to be updated. We start by naturally taking a few libraries with us and I just underline that we are suppressing warnings because Psychic Optimize can give you out warnings when it's testing out the data points that it previously has already seen or it doesn't have any improvement in its optimization process. So we just suppress them if you don't do that, you will see a more verbose list of uh, returning to you. Don't worry for the warning. It's perfectly working good. I was leaving apart the fact that uh, uh, also we decided for Psychic Optimize because it has the same API as Psychic Learn. So you can be confident that using uh, methods like fit and predict you can have exactly the same behavior in Psychic Learn and in Model and in Psychic Optimize. So it's also, for that reason, easier to, <coughs> easier, sorry, to uh, reuse different uh, optimizers under the same code. And this is exactly what we are going to do. We are going to create a report tool that you can reuse, for example, tomorrow for your competition that can take simply your optimizer, the data about uh, your input uh, features, your outcome, you can give it a title, and you can put some callbacks. This is only for Psychic Optimize, that is function that are run between the different rounds of optimization of Psychic Optimizer. How does this record works? Well, first of all, it takes the time. So it can provide you some intuition about how long it's going to take to optimize the work. 
and so you can easily, for example, run it uh, for a few rounds and have an idea if it is taking too long or not. Then of course it's called a fit with callbacks, if callbacks are defined, or just call a fit. <coughs> so if you think now we are going to take a, a grid search and random search, and they can perfectly work inside this buffer. Then we take the best score, we take the standard deviation of the score, okay, and we take the best parameters. And we will return to you the best parameters. The optimizer, since it's passed as a pointer, it's optimized in the sense that it's run, and if you have it in the main memory, it will be perfectly representing the optimization itself. Very important point, we have also to define, uh, to define sorry, a cost function. In this case, we have decided to use the Boston dataset, which is a very small dataset indeed, and use it for classification. We use the top 10% of the uh, real estate values as our target. So we want to create a model that can forecast why a property is very expensive. Actually, by taking the 10% of our target, we are creating an imbalanced classification problem because the majority is 90% and it is not high value. Um, for this kind of problems, often you find useful the ROC LC score, but depending on what you want to provide, sometimes the average precision score, which is the precision calculated at every threshold possible, and then average it, it's more revealing if your models are performing or not. Sometimes you will notice, in fact, that by using rock LC and having a very rare population to guess, you will still get very high rock LC scores. And so it's difficult to discriminate if you are doing a good work or not. So my suggestion also for many projects is to use average precision. It also and depends uh, on, uh, on how bad is a false positive or a true or false negative. For example, um, again, based on my experience, if I'm working on a charm problem, okay, and I make, a, let's say, a promotion to a guy because I think he's leaving, and then he does not leave, I'm wasting money. So no matter, no, it's not, not important for me not to, to know that at the top I found a lot of people that is leaving. It's important to me to not to waste money also. You understand? So it's up them. Okay, so let's continue with Luther. Thank you. <clears throat> Have you noticed also we use a mix scorer, which is a transformation of our cost function into a function which is uh, understandable by grid search, uh, random search, uh, and of course, uh, psychic optimize. Uh, it transform your cost function into an optimization where you input the uh, predictor, you input the uh, features and target, and you just get a score that you have to maximize. So this makes all your problems, no matter, they are maximization or minimization into a maximization problem. And uh, by passing that, uh, uh, site optimize we always work the best. We do some stratified cross validation and we set our first uh, learner for experiment. We just take the gradient boosting classifier from site to learn. So, as you can remember, it's very easy. It doesn't have so many parameters. Basically, learning rate, so how fast it learns through the different reiterations uh, across the residuals of the predictions, the number of estimators, so the number of reiterations you are taking, subsample, if you are subsampling your uh, cases, and you have minimum sample speed and minimum samples left that put a regularization on the fact that uh, since you are using a decision tree, at a certain point you will arrive and have some nodes with very few cases. So you can point out not to split or not to have a, or to stop when you have a certain number of cases at the nodes. 
which prevent, for example, to have a complete fit of your uh, of your examples. And then you have a mass number of features that uh, at every uh, reiteration of a gradient boosting, uh, it is considered for modeling. Um, I forgot to tell you. This is the grid search cross validation. And uh, so we are just inputting our gradient boosting. We just provide the parameter grid, that is a, a dictionary containing all our parameters. And actually, as you know, grid search is just something exhaustive. It just considers all the possible combination of your parameters. So you have to figure out um, some values to be provided. And we just make the combination and test them all. In this case, we just tested a few ones. Oh, what's the difference between the minimum sum split and the minimum sum split? Okay, so the first one, where you have the decision tree inside the gradient boosting, means I arrive at a certain point in the tree and now I have to split. I check how many cases I have at that node. For example, I cause minimum sample split to be five and I find out that I have six cases. That case, the split will happen. On the contrary, I have four cases, the split won't happen, and that node will become the last node. Yeah. The minimum sample leaf means that when I have a split complete, my final node cannot have less than a certain amount of cases. So for example, we just go back to the previous case, we have five, uh, minimum sample split, and so it's okay for our parameters, but by splitting it, we found out that the split is four cases on one side and one case on the other. And for example, we impose minimum sample leaf to be two. So the split won't happen in that case, because the last one should be at least the number that I put in this parameter. Again, it's a form of regularization because it allows you to have final nodes of at least a certain numerosity. Uh, in a certain sense, um, decision trees are splitting your data. So we are creating subsamples. And you figure out that by working on subsamples, you can create a better estimates of what you have to figure out. So you are continuously splitting what you have. Uh, but Statistics, uh, we cannot avoid them, even if we are passionate about machine learning. So uh, we can also figure out that if you are not too small, you are not taking any kind of generalizable information. You are just taking something that is fitting your data, but maybe tomorrow when you are applying test data, it won't work. So it's very important because after all, also in competition, you are test test set and uh, it's good to overfit also the test set but maybe sometimes it doesn't work and it really depends on how the test set is made. To generalize. Yeah. To yes. avoid overfitting. Yes. So going on, number of jobs, we take all the processor power by putting minus one. We use the certified cross validation. We define our scoring. We just say uh, IID false, so we just return the average that every fold has computed, the classical cross-validation, the classical one, and then we just return the train scores, we just say false, we don't need them. Sorry. Can Please? you have multiple scoring functions, like, can you see an average decision? Uh, you mean more scoring? Uh, so like a list of two scoring functions? No, actually not. <laughs> you have if you want to optimize on different, uh, if I interpret it correctly, your question. If you want to optimize, for example, Rockwell C and every precision, you should do on different uh, uh, tests. You can optimize only one cost function at a time. Is it this your question? Uh, to my knowledge, only one cost function. Uh, also, random search is the same procedure. Because actually, it's taking the results and it's taking the best results from cost validation. And the test is done only on the cost function that you have found out. This is 
is somehow reasonable because different cost functions can imply different approaches to your problem. So, I think we have to Maximize both, it's difficult, but you may be a trade off between both. I don't want this one to be too low and this one to be too. Usually, when AAC is high, also everything is high. Yeah, but this is. Um, but I think there's, you can look at it, there's a function called B bit inside the room. Okay. Your question is really very tricky. Something that uh, no one ever ought to have in a workshop, I have to say. Okay. <laughs> but <laughs> I can tell you the answer. Uh, Actually, we can explore it now because it's really something that we deviate from everything. But uh, you have to build your own cost function. Now you can understand better your problem. Yeah. You want something that works for everything. So you have to create a cost function which is the same style of the cost function that you find on Scikit. For example, you can take both, put into a wrapper, and make the average yeah. of them, and then just output, and then pass everything to the make score. But it's something custom yet to do. Because after all, maybe you want to overweight rock uh, out in respect of every procedure. Or you want to do the contrary. So it's something that is really custom and really tailored to your needs. But I think the answer is uh, grid search and random search and Bayesian optimization, they just optimize one cost function at a time. But if you want to optimize a range of them, you have to create your own cost function, just putting them all together. In that case, you can manage it. And this is something maybe we can explore in the next workshop. Or if you want to write to me, you can write together the uh, The choice to use uh, the average precision uh, over the IEC is uh, because uh, we are talking about uh, assemble methods? Or uh, is it possible for all uh, classification models? OK, it's in classification. <coughs> Uh, easier when you want to evaluate uh, rare classes, classification of rare classes, uh, to use uh, average precision because it's more sensible. It will reveal to you better if your positive cases are put on top of a curve. So for many problems, you do not expect exact prediction. But you hope that uh, in a probabilistic terms, your positive cases positive outcomes are have a very high probability. For example, in advertising, you don't predict the exact tweet, but you want a high confidence of a person uh, clicking on your banner. So you expect, in this case, uh, to have such positive cases upper on the curve. Okay. And we notice it, and especially in my experience in fraud detection, and fraud detection is very terrible. You have very few cases, uh, if you use in, in in that context, rock C, you will get very high rock C scores. Because in any case, if you are doing a very bad model, still you have a lot of uh, uh, negative cases, well ordered, because they are everywhere after all. So if you use average precision, you have more sensitivity. And in this case, we wanted to have more sensitivity in order to demonstrate to you uh, the different performances <coughs> of the different optimizer and different uh, uh, cutting boosting techniques, but for reason of average precision. Okay, so that's specific to the use case. Yeah, specific to the use case, and just an idea to you, if you have to work with rare predictions, and you want to have a, how can I say, uh, less optimistic estimate. Okay. Rock C. Okay. Um, so we just run it, it takes just a few Yeah, just one, but it's running. It's running the grid search, so now it's trying all the combination of these parameters. You did not do, uh, do you see here, uh, there is a, an underlying data strategy, I would say. For example, you are not doing any feature engineering. Oh, Pedro, you did the feature engineering. Yes, and we said, we said that it, it's not useful. But imagine that if I did not do this, and he didn't know this, and he did the feature engineering, how long would it take now? So whenever you deal with data, you need a strategy to follow, okay? Here we have 15 features. If um, 
we didn't know that they didn't went, they weren't weren't useful or were useful just a little. We would have night likes uh, 150, 120. I don't know. It would take much more time. This is simply underlying the strategy that we can see. Actually, we say don't do that at home. Do that at home, but don't do before doing that, <laughs> do your job, do the features, don't rush to tune the parameters. Uh, how do you get sensible restrictions for the feature um, ranges, basically? For example, I, I estimated best parameters. This can be a sort of input for this, but, but just an example. Normally, there are other ways that you explain. But for example, again, as a strategy, if I got this list of best iterations, then the iteration can be fixed out like this. And if I see that the parameter works the same on the, on, along the models, I can start with, that, with this one. If I say that they work very bad, I have to make some manual reading. <clears throat> Since we know tomorrow the competition will be very hard, actually, if you, later we just go to the Bison optimization, also the random search will be a little bad. We are providing to you the ranges of the parameters that we saw the most effective in Kaggle competitions. So based on our experience, if you look at the ranges and parameters, we find for all the gradient boosting techniques that we present to you today, the best parameters to optimize. So you can leverage this information. Basically, it's, I say, a double edge sport. So we are quite wide. And maybe for your problem, we are not the right solution. Because if you start, for example, doing random search and the range is too large, you are not lucky enough in the test you are going to do by chance to find the right optimal place. But with Bayesian optimization, you actually can provide very large ranges of possible parameters. And it won't be actually effective because you will find out how to concentrate only on the part that it needs. So, have a look at the parameters. We have a look together, of course. They are very useful. They are general. They are the parameters we use. And maybe you should use your competition. But maybe they are a little bit, how can I say, um, too much for many problems. Uh, Pietro has hinted how to find a more uh, localized subset. But uh, I just say to you, if you use by optimization, you don't need to worry too much. So, grid search completed the job, 52 seconds, it tested 96, com uh, 96 possible combinations. But actually, if you think of it, learning rate and number of estimation are kind of continuous. We miss a lot of possible combinations. Mm, but but could uh, uh, infinite combinations, <laughs> almost, uh, but could be a problem. So basically, random search can provide us the answer. And in order to, to speed up the talk, I really run the chat. Random search, as you can see, has the same exact uh, <coughs> syntax as before the grid search. You just change the comment. But it has a different strategy. When you're doing grid search, you just give a combination of values. And the test is done exactly on that values. With Randomized search, you are providing a different kind of information. You are providing a distribution of your parameters. So for example, in this case, learning rate, we just say that it can be sampled with uniform sampling from 0 0.01 to 1. And random search will pick some examples of this parameter by random. Actually, you may be surprised. This is, this is more, more efficient than grid search. First of all, because, okay, here, as you notice, it gets a better C score, but that could be an artifact. After all, we are doing a workshop, right? We should show the good things to you. But actually, he managed by chance in only 40 attempts against the 96 of grid search. Because actually, many of your parameters most likely won't affect too much 
the result of your problem. Some instead are key ones. By sampling all the ineffective ones, actually you don't spend too much time on them, let's say. If there is something as which ought to be found, by random search, if you are lucky to get the right numbers, we find, and you won't be affected too much by confounding effects of parameters that are not very significant for your problem. As I say, the only bit of uh, trouble that you can have is that it's random. Maybe if you try too few tests, you won't get the best results. And of course, research is kind of deterministic. Every time you will get the same optimization result. Random search won't. So here comes Bayesian optimization. Bayesian optimization is a completely different approach, but it shares some idea with random search. In random search, you go randomly from the first test to the last one. Bayesian optimization starts random. It picks some possible values of parameters and tests them randomly. But it figures out what's underlying. And in the end, it won't look any more random. It will apply <coughs> its search in a more educated way. So it's more of an educated guess than a random guess. How does it work? First, I go around the cell, because this is going to take a little bit longer. And then I explain to you one of the most important optimizer inside the Bayesian optimization is called Gaussian process regression. What's the idea behind that? It is born in South Africa, in uh, uh, Krigley, so looking for gold. If you are looking for gold, you have to make a hole in the ground. It costs time, it costs energy, and you cannot make infinite holes. You have to be very careful how many samples of the ground you take. How can you find where is the gold? Actually, engineers and statisticians found an answer. You start randomly, you make some holes in the ground, you analyze the results, and then, based on the results, you figure out a function that describes that results. If you think, research, search, random search, are direct optimizer. They test a range of parameters and get the results, and they get the best results. Bayes optimization works in a different way. It takes uh, some tests, takes the results, uh, and put the results into another machine learning algorithm. So it's a second level machine learning algorithm that will model your cost function as a target in respect of your hyperparameters. And as you know, the more data you have when you are doing machine learning, the better. So the more samples it takes, the better it is. Moreover, there is some intelligence in this algorithm because it plays on a trade-off between exploration, so picking up many points to figure out uh, how to enrich the prediction of the cost function, and exploitation, text exactly where it thinks at a certain time the minimum is. Let's have a look at this function. This is a function that has been created as an example in the Psychic Optimize website. It shows in the red dotted line the two, uh, <clears throat> the two performance of our predictor. And uh, actually, you get with a green dotted line the model, the underlying model that this Gaussian process figure out. The red points are nothing else than the test that the Gaussian process for Bayesian optimization took. It started, for example, taking a few points around, figuring out something similar, and then it exploited the minimum. 
until he was sure that Amin was reached. And you can see here all the process how it actually went. <coughs> by four points, he figured out uh, this kind of shape of the curve, and then he uses another uh, function called acquisition function to figure out in its internal machine learning algorithms what's the best to look for after these four points. So that you can imagine the four points are random, so it's the same as random search, but after that some computation are made. A model is built and there's a function telling the optimization where to look for. And so it starts exploring different points until it finds out exactly where to explore and where to exploit. Okay, here is still running. Basically, when you are going to use this function called bias search cross-validation, from sky to optimize, you define search spaces using a very similar approach to random search. You define distributions. You define a dictionary with the name of your hyperparameters. And if a distribution is real, real data, you just give the minimum and the maximum. If it is an integer, integer, minimum and maximum. If it is a choice, for example, max features can be uh, square root, the logarithm of base 2, or you don't use at all, you use categorical. So you have just three commands to define the distributions. Sometimes you can also provide information about uh, if the distribution is uniform, log normal, uh, normal, and so on. But in my experience, often is not necessary. Because as I told you, it's exploring and it's building its own function inside the optimization. And it's using four different approaches. So the second level machine learning that I mentioned inside the Bayesian optimization can be a Gaussian process, which is a kind of a linear regression with a kernel that makes it similar to the nearest neighbor regression. Or random forest, or extremely randomized trees, or gradient boosting. So you have four choices, and you can test each one in order to see which works the best. Usually, if you take uh, the Gaussian process, so the GP, as a base estimator, you are not doing the best thing. It's the most common one, most common choice. So the results, so you just check 40, Candidates, so 40 samples. It took a little bit in terms of seconds because it's doing more things, it's building more uh, knowledge than random search, which is just very quick, and also it's embarrassingly parallel. So you can run many experiments. Uh, Bayesian search cannot, it is sequential. So you can take advantage of having many cores on your estimator. Gradient boosting is also sequential, but in finding out the splits, you can use the many cores it has. HTBoost, like GBM, they all take advantage of the many cores that you have in your computer or your server. By this search, you can only check one point at a time, build this model, and then proceed. Do you see how convenient it is to do this? The increasement of the, the improvement of the, of the score is really. Uh, huge because my best score was like 089 okay so to do this it looks like very useful and, and again it's important to have a strategy if, if I did not check and I came to, to look I use all the features maybe we won't have this result now we will have it in half an hour and uh, the workshop would be held this translated in a company environment means days okay so the strategy okay. please when I have some, how would you select this hyperparameter this specific hyperparameter for example, like why you select only those, or what is like the most important hyperparameter out of all of them? And especially for random forest, I would expect like 
not to tune the number of estimator because I would expect if we have like a high number of number of estimator, have like better result from what statistical <coughs> perspective, like having high number of estimator, especially in the random forest, we have like more robust results. Uh, actually, one hidden secret of Bayesian optimization is that it's uh, uh, something for helping you tuning hyperparameters, but it has hyperparameters too, and you don't know how to tune it. Uh, in my experience, uh, the solution is to use a uh, Gaussian process which has very few uh, hyperparameters, or just as the other ones using the default values. Basically, you can go and set all the hyperparameters of these second level models if you know what you do, if you have time. But uh, believe me, if you take it, the default values, it works very well. So focus on the hyperparameters of your main problem, your main classifier. Um, using the wrapping, function and using bias search TV, which is a wrapper itself, actually it's very easy. You just provide your classifier, you provide your parameters, you provide a range, and you let it run. Most likely it will take more time than the random search, but it will reach a better solution in terms of optimization. Anyway, let's see a couple of more tricky questions that you may have. For example, you may have a situation where you want to compare different algorithms or you want to test completely different parameters. So you have two separate spaces. In this case, you just create a pipeline, a pipeline model with your model and then you just give a parameters, specifying your model as a parameter and its space of parameters as a subspace of that model. In this way, for example, you can even compare different models in order to understand which is better. In this case, we just compare if it is better a gradient boosting or a random forest. <clears throat> and another interesting trick is for controlling the time of Bayesian optimization. So, actually, you just provide just show this example back here. The number of attempts. So as in random search, you just say, please, sample, try, 40 combinations, and then tell me what's the best. But maybe you don't have time. 40 combinations can take forever. So what can we do? We just run one iteration of time. So we go low level, and we just use the simple Gaussian process optimizer, and we show you how to use it. Still running. In this case, we use a callback, which is a function that actually just takes the information from the Gaussian process and saves everything on this. And actually saves two variables, it zero and epsilon y zero. What are these? Uh, X zero is uh, a sequence of parameters that the Bayesian optimizer took. So at every time, you know exactly what point it explored. Y zero instead is the result, so their performance. Again, we provide a search space, this time as a list of parameters, and actually you can also name them by using the inside the real integer and categorical, the name parameter. We create an objective function, so basically in this time, this time we really have to create by hand our objective function, and we just minimize it so we to the negative. We make it objective, and then we can run it. We use instead another function from the site <coughs> optimize called GP minimize. GP minimize is just a Gaussian process. It takes 
your objective function, the dimension, acquisition function, I just suggest GPL2. Number of calls, number of times, he has to sample possible parameters, the callback, and random state. So you run it, and you can see exactly what this optimizer is doing. It's telling you now and try this point, so this set of parameters, and getting the result. So this is the result that we took in the end. And by simply uploading it and running it again, what happens? It continues. So basically, if you have short time, you just use GP minimization. You just set a very low number of experiments. You run them. You see the results. If the result is OK, maybe you just stop or you can just continue. A very interesting aspect of this is that actually you can even combine different approaches. What happens here? The GP minimize, the Gaussian process, takes the experience from before. So the points it tried and the results. And just analyze them with its modeling, so second stage machine learning, and acquisition function. So it has something that can model the cost function and tell the process where to look for. But what if I told you that actually you can provide, provide <coughs> the inputs of random search? So if you are really in a rush, what do you do? You just run random search and get the results. All you need is this. <coughs> You just make a list of lists containing in exact order as you define for the optimizer. Otherwise, since it's based on a list, it just positionally you won't understand what it passed. The parameters being tried by random search. So for example, here you have the same sequence of parameters tried as a, sorry, let me just go back, specified here. So first learning rate the number of estimators, the subsample, the minimum sample speed, and minimum sample left, and max features. And then you put inside another list the results. And it will take this information. If you already reach a very good minimum, OK. You just make your submission, and you take your place on the leaderboard. But if something else could be done, it takes the experience of a random search and it tries to make it even better. So it starts exploring points that the random search, because of chance, didn't explore. And we optimize fewer. So this is very interesting because if you think that in optimizing your function, you eat a wall, you take all your experiments, all your experience, everything you have done, and you just put into this algorithm and you start trying something new for you. <coughs> I think we are right, <coughs> sorry, at the most interesting part. <coughs> Tomorrow you won't be using Gabriel Boosting on Scikit-Learn but most likely, like GBM as Pietro did. So what are you going to do? Simple. You define your classifier. You define your search space, and here you can find all the intervals that we found most useful. You just define your bias search CV. You just specify your classifier, search space, scoring, cross-validation, number of times, in this case we just keep 40, and then you just run everything. You just ask for the best parameters, <coughs> and it's done. Actually, you just wait, and the best result will come out. In the same fashion, you can do exactly what we did for the step-by-step -step Gaussian process optimization. So again, you define your classifier, you define your dimension, this time not in a 
dictionary button list. You make your objective, in this case, it's just simple. The, your average um, uh, precision score, and then you run it for 10, for example, calls, see the results, and then decide if to run more. Or you try first random search, you put all the, your results into X0 and Y0, and you try to look for better improvement. Taking a while. Oh, if you want to take a chance for a question, no. what, what is the scalability of the base uh, uh, optimization? <coughs> the problem in terms of the uh, number of, of the size <coughs> of the data set and also the dimension. Um, you have the same problems as running your estimator. The only problem is the time it takes. So it can take uh, double the time of a random search. We believe it that the random search is parallel, so if you have multiple calls, actually you can take very good advantage, whereas your Bayesian optimizer just explores one point at a time and can take advantage of your multiple calls only on the estimator function. Uh, only. Um, there's a paper by Google, because actually one of the motivation for showing you Bayesian optimization is that if you're going to use Google products, you will find something called AutoML, Automatic Machine Learning. And if you're wondering what's behind that, actually there's exactly this technique, by their optimization. But with a caveat, so <coughs> a point of attention, they study very closely and find out this rule. If a problem you are trying to solve is very fast to be solved, so the training is not too long, why losing time with binary optimization? Actually, we are just making a test here, and still you see it takes time to, to run. Uh, so if it is fast, no need. You just do random, and you take as many random tests as you can in order to find the best combination. So it's worth, if your training is long, let's imagine you have many data, and your uh, light GDN takes a long time to finish one complete fitting. And there is, this is the lower boundary, an upper boundary. The upper boundary, if you are, if you are optimizing more than 16 parameters, at that point, this space of parameter is so complex that also by the optimization we struggle to find the correct modeling for it. We say there is a second level model, which is Gaussian process, Ramon Forest, or gradient boosting, but still, no matter how flexible they are, at that point it will become very tricky. A few examples, high dimensionality. So we suggest, okay, forget it, use again random search. So basically, you have to evaluate if it is number one, long training. If it is long training, Bayesian optimization is a good choice. Then number of parameters you are going to fix. If it is long training, but the number of parameters is more than 16, maybe take uh, again a random approach. So this is basically the, uh, the solution for scalability. Uh, <clears throat> it's taking a long time. Maybe Google servers are a bit busy. So we just proceed and have a look instead of the other approaches. One is XGBoost. As you can see, it's exactly the same approach. You just change the classifier, you change the search space, and that's done. You can exactly use the same procedure. In this case, you can see the results. And finally, cap boost. Nothing different, but with a few uh, points of attention. And the point of attention is about uh, uh, the fact that cap boost, uh, being used by second optimized sometimes gave segmentation fault. So, we found a solution for you, which is just use one single job. So don't use any parallelism if you're using cut boost. Let cut boost do everything by itself. In this case, you can find all the search space. And here is the result. 
So we still have, I think, half an hour. Would you like to take it together the exercise? Okay, the exercise is about a law competition. A competition that actually I took a few years ago and it was a little bit tricky because um, it had very high cardinality. Okay, we have 10 to 15 minutes, so uh, we'd like to try the exercise or have more questions for me. What, what's the exercise? Uh, Amazon Challenge. It's a kind of competition of the past. It's a high cardinality competition because it's based on a certain number of uh, features which are actually, let me show you, which are actually um, categorical. So Amazon had this problem, and maybe this problem is common to many companies where we work. Uh, you don't have access to all the data. You have to ask permit. So you go to your security officer, and you ask, oh, man, I want to see my table, and I want to, to do some modeling. And the security office tells you, OK, let me evaluate the situation, if I give you access or not. And it can take a very long time. So at Amazon, since they wanted to let the employees have access to the data that could provide them information for doing good modeling and providing value to the firm, they thought, why don't we automate it? So we just provide some information. What the data you are looking for? Who are you? Who is your boss? What level you are in the hierarchy? And this kind of information we are looking for, let's say, what part of the company it, it touches. So a lot of categorical. Some variables even have thousands and thousands of levels. So the trick was to use something like logistic regression. So you just do a very big one hot encoding. But then you have a problem of, uh, of course, interactions. Or otherwise, you use gradient boosting, but you have to do target encoding, that is transforming your information singularly and making interactions into a value. For example, you have uh, the role of the rec uh, person requiring the role of a boss, two variables, and you just make the interaction. You just put them together, you obtain an even larger, many levels variable, and you just have a look at the target, so you just learn what value you should have. I hope you are already acknowledging the target encoding. Cut boost can do that all by itself, actually. And the interesting thing of this exercise is that if you try, you will get a score which will place you very high on the historical leaderboard. Very, very high. This is because of cut boost, because it's very good at encoding, but also because of the good parameters find by by even search. So this is the content of the exercise. I have a just a general question. So this was about uh, gradient boosting um, and the optimization methods to this. Can you apply it to other uh, algorithms? And what are the differences when you apply it? Okay, you can apply basically this kind of approach to every problem you have in machine learning even to deep learning. In fact, uh, I will prepare a next workshop where it will help the same methodology uh, help you to figure out, for example, if you have to stack multiple layers of LSTM, for example. So basically, you can apply it to everything you have in mind. But as I said in my previous answer, at some point of attention. It takes time, right? So, or you have a lot of time, or you have to optimize uh, how you spend your time. So if you have very few parameters to optimize, the training is not too long, okay. Random search is the best. Random search is also suggesting for finding uh, neural architecture, after all. So it's a good choice, not that one. Or, as I say, if you have a too complex space, 
in that case, <coughs> at Google, they found out that simply doubling the number of samples that you try by random search, you can have the same level of performance as uh, a Bayesian optimization. So no limit for that. Uh, compatibility, of course, with Psychic Lab API. Fit predict. Yes. And uh, for bias, what uh, would you recommend a Gaussian process regressor as a rule of thumb uh, basis to measure? <clears throat> yes, because it has a less number of hyperparameters. Basically, the most sensible one is how it decides, uh, looking at all these internal functions, what is the uh, best solution to minimize. It has different opportunities because it has a different function to look at. It has kind of expectation of minimization, it has a, a point value, it has a range of values, so it has many point of views. Uh, I suggested the basic default optimum, which actually is kind of heuristic that the programmers or psychic optimized decided. And this is enough, basically. Instead, if you are trying other solutions, uh, maybe you have to do something. Maybe not for <coughs> random forest, but most likely for a gradient boosting as a second level model. Maybe you have to do some tuning. So, if there are no other questions, we can close the workshop. But if you have time, to test, test the exercise, you will find it enlightening. You have both the version where you have to fill in the gaps and the version with already the solution. So you can see the result. And if you have a carbon kernel, you can immediately post it on the carbon leaderboard and see the results. Thank you for attending. Thank you. Thank you.